Well, Durham Regional Police have released dramatic footage of a pursuit of two suspects in a break and enter at a bank. They just blew the lights at Highway 2, northbound on Harwood. I'm going to switch to two here. I don't know exactly what happened, but at 12.31 in the morning, I came to and I was laying in a field on my back. And I remember my first memory is yelling for help. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm going to be interviewing Christopher Stevenson. He is a, I'm going to say an ATM, I don't want to say bandit, um, I want to say he pulled off ATM heists. I'm going to go with heists. So uh, it's, it's going to be a super cool interview. Uh, he's in out of uh, Canada, and um, really interesting story. Uh, I've actually already read an article on him and I watched a video where they, there was a high speed chase and I'll have to ask you about that. That was kind of funny. So, all right. And, uh, so check this out. All right. So, so I have a question. So where were you born? Here in London, Ontario, London, Ontario. Okay. Yes. And uh, I mean, so mom, dad, brothers, yeah, sisters, mom, dad. I yeah. have a half brother and sister from my dad and then a half sister from my mom, but I'm an only child between my mom and dad. Okay. I mean, and where, well, I mean, were you a good kid? Were you, um, I was, uh, a bit of a hell raiser, I guess, but a, a good person in nature, but I was just, uh, I don't know. I always like to kind of be bad and cause trouble and wreak havoc on people and yeah, just have fun. Right. So yeah. what, I mean, what, I mean, where'd like, you go to school? Well, I got, what's that? Where'd you go to school? I mean, did you I, graduate high school? Did you? So I would, yeah, I, I graduated high school. I, um, I was forced to go to Catholic school what, up until grade eight. And then when high school came, I just refused. My mom was pretty religious and I had that stuff all forced down my throat. I was an altar boy and all that type of stuff, right? And then uh, I gave up the Catholic school because I probably spent more time out in the hallway for doing stupid stuff than I ever did in the classroom. And I just got sick of that. So I gave up the Catholic school, went to public high school. And then I graduated. I mean, I was in and out of jail as from the age of 14, grade nine, so I did, I did a lot of, uh, I did a lot of schooling in jail and gra I actually got my grade 12 in jail. What did you, what'd you do at 14 to go to? <laughs> I, uh, me and a guy, we were going out at lunchtime on our lunch break and doing house B and E's. And, uh, we ended up going to this one house and the guy was home sleeping and we're trying to get in the back door and he woke up and chased us down and it was like, you know, lunchtime and yelling at the neighbors and they all fucking jumped on us and yeah, didn't end well. How, how much time did you get for that? I got, uh, well, so I got out and what well, I didn't get out. Sorry. I was in and the police called my mom and my mom had had enough. And she said, you know what? I can't control them anymore. You keep them. So then I became a crown ward. Right. And they started putting me in group homes and I wouldn't stay there. So I'd run away and then they'd catch me and put me in another one and I'd run away. And I actually ended up uh, doing a robbery. And How old were you then? 14. This is only like a couple months after, a month, two after or whatever, right? And okay. uh, so this was the end of June. School was just finishing and uh, they weren't letting me out anymore. And I remember I got remanded into the little kid jail there until September was my next court appearance. And I basically thought that was the end of the world. I got to be in jail for the whole summer, right? At 14 years old. So yeah, they locked me up. Anyways, I ended up doing uh, seven and a half months, I think when I was 14 for my first time. Okay. But you, so it was, it was like a juvenile. Detention juvenile yeah. Yeah. Young offender. And, they call it in Canada. But then as soon as you, you got out of there, you went right back to a group home. Um, so once I got out of there, uh, yeah. Yeah. They wanted me to go back to another group home and I just keep running away. Right. I didn't want to be there. So I, I just kept running away and, you know, going out, doing more crimes and just, 
That sounds like yeah. Boziak. This living, guy living on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've watched him. Well, basically, that's just the lifestyle. Like, who wants to be in a group home with a bunch of people that you don't know, you don't like, following rules and people that you don't want to listen to, right? You're a young kid. You think you know everything in the world, so you just do what you think you can do. And it was a learning curve. Let's say that. So what? So what happened? I mean, you know, did you graduate? Did you get locked up again? Oh yeah, you were at oh yeah, or? yeah, 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 oh, yeah. I kept like I was in and out all the time. <laughs> and uh, when I was 15 years old, I ended up robbing a variety store with three other guys. With we had knives, and uh, I ended up getting 16 months for that. What's a variety store like? A, uh, a, like convenience, a convenience store. store. Yeah, yeah. A convenience okay. store, right? And uh, we did. I did that, and, and I got 16 months. Well, how'd you get caught for that? So the place that these guys that I was with, they were older than me. And I didn't, I, I grew up in a family that there was no, like you get certain families where crime's kind of normal for the family and you hear about stuff. I grew up religious, so I didn't know how to do anything and get away with it or nothing. So everything was a learning curve for me. So these guys, we, we robbed the place and we were going back to this girl's house that they knew Well. She fucking walked back to the variety store, her and her boyfriend, to supposedly check it out. Well, as soon as she saw the cops, she's like, oh, they're at my house. So the boyfriend was nice enough. He called. He said, yo, get the hell out of there. So we got out, but they had the whole neighborhood surrounded, and we just, yeah, it didn't work out well. So, And you got 16 months? I got 16 months for that. I was 15. So that went until I was 16. And then I just kept doing all the same shit, right? Up until, so then when I was in grade 12, I was 18. Like I would do, you know, eight months here for stealing cars or this and that. And then uh, when I was 18, I got caught for two stolen vehicles. And the lawyer that I had railroaded me pretty good. And so in Canada, it doesn't really matter if you've got a church. So you see you got one stolen car or five stolen cars. You're not going to get five times the amount of time because you right. have five. You'll get the same whether it's one or five. So this lawyer, for some reason, split the charges up. And he told me I was going to get 90 days to, to serve on weekends, intermittent it's called, right? So I could stay in school and graduate. So I went up and the judge ended up giving me seven months. So I had to go in and do that straight. Well, now I go back to court because I still have the other one to deal with. And the judge slaps me with another nine on top of the seven. So now I'm doing 16 months. And they took me up to this treatment place. I said, oh, I got an alcoholic and I got problems, right? So they sent me up to this treatment place. Well, that ended up just being more of a party than anything up there. And ended up doing my thing, whatever. Anyways, my mom contacted the jail and she wanted me to move back closer to home because this way I was about seven hours away from home. And my mom wanted me to move back because she was moving to Scotland and she wanted to spend time with me before she had left. So she got me transferred to this minimum security jail and so anyways, they transferred me back there and it was weird. I'd never seen a jail where you sign in. There was a log book that you sign in when you got there. And I was looking at the names that had come in and I'm like, there's one of my buddies. I'm like, did this guy just get out? They're like, no, he was on the bus last week. I'm like, oh no. So as soon as I saw that, as soon as I saw him, he's like, Chris, I got three ways we can get out of here without getting caught. I'm like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> so we ended up getting screwdriver and some tools and stuff and we took some cornfield parole a few days later and ended up stealing a truck and getting out of there and anyways when i got caught for 19 break and enters later and some stolen cars and guns and stuff i ended up doing four years altogether when i was 18. so how did you get well how did you end up getting out of the facility and jump just well it was just a minimum security probably like that out. Old, yeah 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 there was a it was actually an old airfield base so the, we were just outside and they actually we were on our way to the school at on our way to school and there was no fence or nothing. Literally, they called it cornfield parole because it was cornfields all around. And we just ran off into the cornfield and waited till nighttime and then came out, stole ourselves a truck to get home. And that was it. And then just went on a big crime spree from there. Right. How long? So what? how did you get caught that time? I, uh, I got caught up in. Muskoka, which is a big cottage um, area up here. It's all islands and stuff. And uh, we were up there doing a bunch of break and enters and stealing boats and sea dews and just having fun. And uh, 
somehow they knew we were up there and they ended up bringing in these all these tactical cops and everything and we were trapped on an island they had come and pulled their boat away and they were bringing cops back and forth on this island it was about four or five hours and then finally the fucking island just lit up and there was swat everywhere and we ended up getting arrested and then I got, yeah, it was, well, I would already been doing 16 months. And then I got another 30 months for all that stuff. And then they brought me back to the little town where the jail I had taken off from. And they gave me another two months for the escape. So it was four years altogether. Did you, did you ever graduate high school? Yeah. Yeah. I graduated. Uh, I was probably uh, 28 years old, but I was in jail. I'd finally got all my credits and everything. Okay. And then after that, I've gone to college. I got some, I was doing a business uh, diploma. I'd never finished it, but I've taken some college. So, so, I mean, what, so um, you graduated, you got out of jail, you, you went to school, you got a good job, you had a couple kids, you, and now you've just been yep. living your life on the straight and narrow ever since. Um, well, so, no? <laughs> so let's just get to the bottom of something here. Right. I, I kind of told you this before. In Canada, we don't have a statute of limitations, right? right. And our justice system works different than your guys does, right? Yes. You guys get away with a lot more stuff, but when they get their sink their teeth into you, they take a big bite. Yes. Where here, they don't get their they get their teeth into you more, but they, the bite doesn't hurt as much. Yeah, right? you're going in and out of jail. Like, I don't know anybody. That's a lot. Exactly, of right? There, you get a lot more forgiveness here, right? They don't give you as much time, and you get back out, and you get to do it again. But you're in and out a lot more, right? So the, the criminal record gets long, and, you know, you're just doing your thing. So anyways, I haven't been caught for a lot of stuff, right? right. And, like, whereas – you, you're probably at like 98% of all the crimes you've committed, you've been caught for, right? Like yeah. I'm, I'm probably about 1%, right? If not even 1%, right? Like my whole life from the age of 14 till just the last couple of years, you're talking 20, 30 crimes a day, easy. Right. Right. So, you know, you get caught for say 20 and you go and do a few months. Well, do the numbers. It's a very small percentage compared to what you've done constantly. Right. Yeah. So we don't have a statute of limitations here. So I kind of got to be careful as to what exactly I talk about because they can come back and hit me. If I give enough information, they could come back from some 25 years ago and send me to jail for it. That's and that, that does happen up here. <laughs> That's not, not often, but I mean, I'm sitting here openly giving information and I, I've, I've spoken with lawyers. I understand hopefully what I can and can't do. Right. So, um, all right. So after you, so you get out, so you were, you were committing crimes periodically. Yeah. What's the next thing that kind of happened that well, you can think? So when I went to, I got the four years when I was 18 now. So Canada's justice system is you got, so you guys have state and federal. We yeah. have provincial and federal here. So provincial means you're doing two years less a day or less. If you get two years or more, then you're in the federal system. It goes on time, not your crimes like you guys. Okay. Right? So that time put me into the federal system. So now I'm in the federal penitentiary, right? And everyone's like, oh, don't worry. You're going to go down there. You're 18 years old. They're just going to put you in a camp. You'll get parole right away. Yeah, no. Because I had did that escape. It put me in one one level below maximum security, which was a high medium, right? So they put me in Collins Bay Institution with some pretty serious guys, right? So I'm sitting there, and there was no parole. There was no nothing. I got caught the night before my parole hearing, fucking drunk up on moonshine, and woke up in the hole the next day with my parole officer handing me clean clothes going, uh, here's some clothes, Chris, your parole hearings in half an hour. Right. I, I knew I wasn't going nowhere. I didn't have anything. So I had to do my whole two thirds of the four years in a high security institution with, you know, murderers and fucking just bad people. Right. So I met a lot of people and I'm a pretty personable guy. So guys like me. And so I learned a lot of stuff while I was there. You're basically prisons like college, right? For criminals. Right. That's where you go and learn everything. So I had met a guy in there 
he's a fucking rat, so I'll fucking don't care about his fucking name. Chuck, you goof. Uh, anyways, he uh, showed me a lot of stuff about how to do B and E's, probably commercial break and enters, how to open locks and spin locks and do this and do that. So when I got out of prison after that, I actually it was actually weird. I was downtown. I think I was going to the welfare office to get a check when I had just gotten out, and I saw him on the corner, and he had remembered me from prison, and he said, "Hey, are you interested in working?" And I said, "You know what? Yeah." I said, here's my number. Give me a call if something comes up. He's like, you know, I might need a guy. He's like, you know how to steal vehicles, right? I'm like, yeah. He says, okay, I'll get in contact with you. So anyways, he did. And uh, we partnered up and started doing um, clothing stores, like in malls, breaking into malls, uh, wherever. We had it. At, a, we, at night? At night, yeah. Going in and just cleaning the place out all night, right? And then I could steal the vehicles. So we'd steal cube vans to empty everything out. So we'd go in, pack it all up, and then at fucking five o'clock in the morning or whatever, bring the cube band, bam, 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 load it up, and you're gone. He had a guy who was a booster, a shoplifter, right? And so he would drive all over Ontario. It's with a, he had a big van and he'd bring all these boosters with them and they'd go out stealing. Well, he was also scoping out the stores for us to find out wh where everything was at. Da, 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 da. So he'd come back from these boosting trips and then he'd send us and we'd go and then clean all these stores out and then he'd sell everything for us, right? So we did that for a good while. And that's when my first son was born after I got out of prison and I was doing that. And then uh, me and another guy, I had brought in a friend of mine and we were coming back from this job that we went to look at the one day and we stopped at this liquor store. Now a liquor store in Ontario is run by the government. It's not like you guys where they sell liquor in every store, right? They, right. It's run by the government and their special stores. So anyways, we had stopped at the liquor store to grab a, another six pack for the rest of the ride home. And I walk in the liquor store, grab my beer and I come out and I said to my buddy, I'm like, yo, I said, go in that store. Tell me what you see. So he goes in, he comes back out. He's like, bro, that place ain't alarmed. I'm like, no fucking shit. Right? So I, da ding, da ding, da ding. Well, what's easier to sell than booze? Right? Booze is liquid gold. Right. Right? This, you could sell it for half price. Clothing, we're lucky to get a quarter on clothing. Right? Booze, I'm selling it at half price all day long. You can't get enough of the shit. Everybody wants it. Right? So, we stumbled upon that, and then I started doing liquor stores. Well, I uh, I ran the wheels off of that shit for ten years, all over the province, everywhere. I had a, I ended up getting taken down. The liquor, it's the LCBO, the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. They actually put a task force to stop me because they had had enough. And when it all went down, it went bad because I had this guy with me, and he ended up fucking ratting me out. And he called me, actually. He, he got charged. We were in the middle of doing one, and he did something stupid, and he got himself arrested. We hadn't even gone into the place. All we had done was shut the – by this time, they were alarmed, okay? Yeah. We had already, I've already shut, so we're shutting the alarms off. So all I've done is cut the fucking wires to shut the alarm down. Well, it turned out that it had shut something down elsewhere, too. So the police showed up. So he was walking through the parking lot and he had a walkie-talkie on his hip. The police pulled in and questioned him, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, they take him away. He went down to the police station and fucking puked his guts out and told them that I'd been the guy that's been doing this shit for the last 10 years and blah, 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 blah. He got, they released him obviously from the police station and he fucking calls me and I'm like, yo, bro, fucking glad you're out. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, yeah, I just want to let you know uh, I said a little bit more than I should. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I, I routed you out. I'm like, oh, right on. Thanks, bro. <laughs> and uh, anyways, I didn't realize how bad he had routed me out. So I mean, he couldn't have just said the one the he, one thing. Exactly. So he's <laughs> like, no, this is the guy. Because they hadn't, for some reason, they hadn't pieced together that I'd been responsible for a fucking 10 years of this all happening. Maybe it's because they get hit so much, so many different angles, but I mean, nobody was doing it the way I was doing it. 
right? Guys would fucking smash into the place and grab whatever they could, you know what I mean? Quickly. No, one, I don't think many people were going in and emptying the whole place out, taking the whole night and emptying it out. But either way, it doesn't matter. Well, it takes, it takes, it takes guts to stick around. Yeah. Cause you yeah, get in well, there, you know, your, your, your heartbeat, your well, adrenaline starts going for you to stick around that, that, that takes fucking, well, that takes balls it, to stick it around. Does, but, I, but I always say to people, they can't see through the fucking walls. Once I'm in it there, doesn't matter. People are scared. People get yeah, scared. I know. They I know. I know that. Trust me. Listen, bro. I've taken a lot of people out doing scores. I know how they act when they're in there. Like, yo, fucking yep. relax, right? I had. They're all. Yeah, they're all badasses when they're sitting in the yeah, bar talking about it. Comes, push comes to shove. <laughs> listen, I we had this one time. Our scout guy that I told you about, he went out and he found this bedding store, right? And they had fucking all high end bedding, and expensive shit. Well, we don't care what it is. We'll take it as long as it's worth money. We're stealing it, right? So three of us, we go do this bedding store. Well, we had everything all packed up by like fucking midnight at the back door ready to go. Well, we always stuck with the rule. You don't do anything till five o'clock in the morning. Let the traffic start flowing in the morning. And, you know, the cops are going to their fucking shift change, right? Everything's good. So me and my buddy, we hop up. There's two beds in the fucking front windows in the showroom, right? <laughs> He hops in one bed. I hop in the other. We had a fucking nap. The third guy's running back and forth. What the fuck is wrong with you guys? What are you doing? I'm like, yo, bro, shut the fuck up and relax, man. I'm trying to relax here. And yeah, so we had a nap. That was that was an interesting one. But yeah, this guy. So that's exactly what you're saying, right? People aren't cut out to be in there doing that. They're fucking nervous. They think. That, but once I'm in there and everything's shut down, there ain't nobody coming. Yeah. Now, there is the odd exception. You know, you might get a place where an employee forgot something in the office, right? You can't account for that. That's the, yeah, the whole, exactly. I always saw that that's the fly in the ointment. Like you exactly. just, can't, that's, that's the, the worst. That's the invariable, right? Yeah. He's been known to cure insecurity just with his laugh. His organ donation card lists his charisma. His smile is so contagious. Vaccines have been created for it. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. I actually, I can tell you another one. Me and a friend of mine, we did a place, and I'm not going to say what was in the place, but we're in there, and we had just gotten in. We'd fucking come through the roof shut the alarm off. Everything's fucking great. Him and I are in the back room and we're arguing about something that's back there. And he's like, that's $10,000. I'm like, no, it's not, bro. It's not. I'm, he's like, yeah, that's $10,000. I'm like, it's not. I'm like, well, fuck it. Let's go to the showroom. We'll look. It'll be a price on the fuck one out in the showroom. We go out there and they had had, you know, the stores get those roll down shutters. Yeah. Right. It had the roll down shutters on this store. Oh, I fucking look up and there's three guys peeking into the fucking window. There was a live feed on the camera system in there, right? We didn't we didn't know this, obviously. So we we fucking look. I'm like, holy shit! We go flying out the back door, and you can hear the cops fucking coming. We were about ten seconds away from getting surrounded in the place. Boom! Out the back door, and we were gone. <laughs> um, hey, can you talk? Get a little bit closer to your mic. Well, you're gonna make me look like I'm deep throating the fucking thing. Well, I mean, you could always say it, <laughs> it really. Turn it up? You're typically what you. I'm sorry. How's that? How's that? If I turn it up. Uh, yeah, yeah. that's better. It, you know, typically what happens is you want to be a, around a fist away. That right there. Yeah, but that's perfect. Like okay. if you can stay there or closer, that's perfectly fine. All right. How about sorry. That? Yeah, that's even. Yeah. Not even better. All I mean, right. unfortunately, I'm sorry. I. I you know, or you can use the one on your computer. It's just that my, my fear is that, you know, people aren't going to be able to hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I'll, I'll just oh. hold it like this. I was hoping to have one of those fancy ones with the whole pole and everything, but. Well, you know, I your buddies. I didn't, I didn't get one of those. I mean, you know, that's some This sorry. is concrete, right? No, no. If you were here, <laughs> if you were here, I got them. Yeah. Uh, well, whatever. I'll survive. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so okay so what happens so your buddy tell uh your one buddy or rats you out and do the cop the cops come looking for you well yeah so anyways they uh they ended up what happened they came and they fucking they were looking for me i knew that he i was wanted so they were looking for me so anyways 
I had this girlfriend and we had just moved to a new place. So everything was groovy. They couldn't catch me. So I, uh, you know, I was just riding it out, doing my thing. Well, anyways, her dog ended up having a fucking issue or something. And then he was, the dog bit somebody or I don't know what the heck, I can't remember what happened, but the authorities got called. And I fucking, as soon as the call came in and they ran her name, I said, this is going to fucking end bad real quick. Well, sure enough, about 15 minutes later, fucking surrounded, right? So anyways, they charged me. They had to release me on bail because by this time, everybody had gone to him and be like, yo, bro, you can't do this. You got to, you got to take your statement back, right? You, You can't fucking do this. So he went back and rescinded his thing. So they released me on bail while whatever was going to happen, happen. Right. By this point, I don't know that this whole task force thing is going on. So I'm still going about my business, but you know, I got a curfew and I'm stuck at home, blah, blah, blah. I won't get into details, but shit's going on either way. Right. Well, shit's going on a little too much. Fucking heat's getting bad. So I just go on the run. Of course. In Canada, at the end of the day, this is just a simple B and E, commercial B and E. This isn't a house B and E where people's lives are in danger. Yeah, it's commercial break and enters. Not as yeah. serious on the spectrum. It's not that bad. So I'm like, you know, there's, there's only so much they can do. Well, I'm getting phone calls from my mom, my friends, and the fucking cops are showing up with warrants to their houses, harassing them and fucking searching them. I'm like, how is this happening? How are they afford to fucking send these fucking retards chasing me, me all yeah. day, right? So anyways, it was about nine months later, I got caught and I'm like, I've been waiting to fucking talk to this cop. I want I want the lowdown. Like, what the fuck is going on? Where did this come from? Right? So I finally got to sit down with him and oh, I was sitting in the jail and I remember it was morning time. And somebody had come into the jail and there was a bunch of ecstasy. Well, don't I fucking the retard? I take an ecstasy about 9 30 in the morning. Well, about 10 15, I get Stevenson, you got a visit. Well, in jail, there's no visits in the morning for your family. It's afternoon and nighttime. So I know it's a professional visit. It's the cops. I'm like, fuck. And I'm just starting to fucking trip out on ecstasy, right? So I get down there and I'm like, listen, how the fuck does this happen? He's like, this was the LCBO that financed this. Your buddy fucking gave you up and told him that this is, you're the guy that's been doing all this and all the damage that you've done, you know, like I did a lot of damage to their buildings and, you know, well, you cut the roof out of a building in the middle of winter and all that snow, the heat's billowing out, starts melting all the snow and all that water's coming in and just... It was a nightmare. So anyways, the LCBO wanted it shut down and they told the London cops, they said, listen, put an end to this, get this guy and put a stop to it. So while I was on the run, I was running with this other guy that I knew. Well, I didn't know he was fucking working with the cops too. He wasn't giving me up, but he ratted me out because he got caught for something. Well, it turned out, well, I'm sitting in jail. I'm a, I'm expecting to be going to prison for four or five years. I got, this shit's coming down. I know it's coming down, right? And I know this guy's working with them. They've got their shit together, right? So I'm just sitting there waiting and waiting. And I'm like six months. I'm calling my lawyer every so often. I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? And my lawyer was like, they're silent. They're not doing nothing. They're not doing nothing. So finally, he comes up and he's like, Chris, he says, I got you a deal for 90 days, weekends, for the stolen vehicle that I got originally got caught with. That's how they got me. Right. Because I've already served six months, which in Canada was works as nine. Right. So then I'm going to get another 90 days doing to weekends for a year for a stolen vehicle. Right. I'm like, there's no way. Cause if I get weekends, that means once I get sentenced, I'm, I go back to the jail, I get processed and I'm going home today. I'm like, there's no fucking way. Like in my mind, I'm going away for a few years. Right. Right. I'm like, there's no way, Glenn, this isn't happening. He's like, Chris, I've ran a fucking check. There's no holds. There's no warrants. There's nothing. You're going home today. I'm like, Glenn, this isn't making sense. No, no. So he goes, I get my weekends. I get back to the jail and I'm sitting there and a couple other guys got weekends, right? And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden the guard calls me to bring me back around to change me back into jail clothes. I'm like, what do you mean? I said, I'm going home. I got weekends. 
something's wrong, Chris. We're going to take you upstairs and we'll let you know what's going on. <laughs> the fucking uh, Hamilton police, which is another a town about an hour down the road, had a warrant that they had withheld, didn't put it on the system, right? So that it was in the CPIC system, right? They held it, but had the jail hold it without doing this. This is totally illegal, right? This is a, you guys got the constitution. We got the charter of rights and freedoms. This is fucking totally against your charter of rights and freedoms, but they did it. So eventually I'm sitting in my cell about 1130 at night. The fucking Lieutenant comes and gets me and he's just shaking his head. He's like, Chris, I've never seen this in my life. He's like, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what to say to you, but you're getting fucked here. <laughs> right. I said, what? He says, you've got a warrant and they're Hamilton's coming to take you there. I'm like, for what? They're like a shoplifting charge. I'm like shoplifting. I'm fucking shoplift. Right. So <laughs> anyways, they take me back there. I go, they deny me bail. Right. So now I got to sit there and wait. So I said to my lawyer, I'm like, listen, there's no way that I did this. I, I don't shoplift. So he's like, okay, well, let me, let me go and watch. They said they got you on video and your friend, my best friend in the world at the time had ratted me out. I'm like, there's no way my buddy ratted me out. There's no way I'm on camera. I didn't shoplift nothing. So my lawyer goes and watches the video. Right. And he's like, you're right. It's not you. And your buddy didn't rat you out. Your buddy said, Chris's friend sold him the stuff. Not Chris. Well, that's a big difference. Yeah. But they used that against me to hold me in. And they forced me to plead guilty because if I didn't plead guilty to that, they, I pled guilty and they released me that day right there. If I didn't, I would have had to sit there for a year and wait for a trial to prove that it wasn't me to get in front of a judge to prove that that wasn't me in court. The crown would not drop the fucking charge. The, the crown in Canada is the prosecutor. Yeah. 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 Crown attorney. Right. So that's like, it's extortion justice in this country. They extort you to plead guilty. That's all they want here is the conviction. Listen, they don't bro, it's, care it's about putting you in jail. It's the same thing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. but you for for you guys, well, I mean, here it's a financial thing too, right? But they don't make the money. Like you, your jails are all private down there, so it's just a serious business, right? Where here it's not so much like that. Like it's all government, but it's still you're still keeping the police employed, the crown, the probation officers. Like the economy, economy would just fucking deplete if you took crime away, right? It, it, would, yeah. it, would, it would kill the economy. Yeah. You're still committing crime, though. You still, you still got to do something. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so can't just say, ah, let's scrap the system. Let these guys go wild. Yeah. No, 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 no. Of course. Of course. Um, but, so what happened then? What happened? Um, so, so I got out and obviously I couldn't break into the liquor stores anymore because yeah. that would probably have not been such sure. a good idea. They're, they're on to you. They're, yeah, they're kind of on to me. So I have to uh, come up with another plan. So I don't know. I always kind of resorted to what I know. I'm a, I'm a burglar, right? I break into shit. And uh, so I floated around for a while. And then I ran into a guy. And I guess I'd always kind of heard of these people who break into the bank machines, right? There was a, a crew here in my city that had been pretty prolific at it. And it was, was many years before this at the, this time. And it, it always talked about it. You've always heard all this stuff, right? So it was always in the back of my mind. I got to check this out. Got to check right. this out. Who, who, who was that? Was that, that? Who was that? Was that um, uh, Gerald Blanchard? Have you ever heard that name? Gerald Blanchard? No. He was in uh, Wired Magazine. I When I was locked up, I read an article about him and he was, Breaking into ATMs. Was he Canadian? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. How old was he? Um, he was in his late 20s, early 30s. And this was probably 10 years, about 15, 15 years ago. No. Gerald Blanchard. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Now, I can't, anything that you are ever going to read or see is pretty much guaranteed. It's the little private ATM machines that people can buy and put in their variety stores or whatever. No, th this was, this was actually a ATMs. He was, he was finding banks that were being, banks were being, you know, built remodeled. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then just before, and I, I guess apparently your ATM machines are on the inside, right? Like you have yes. doors 
You can't leave them outside. So he would wait till like the banks were going to, it's a new bank. It's going to be opened on Tuesday. Yeah. He was, well, the night the, he would break in before that, fi- get the, he'd get the, um, uh, the uh, serial number of the ATM machine. Uh-huh. He would contact the manufacturer and say that he was with the bank and they'd lost their key and he'd order another key. Really? Huh. So now he's got the key to the back of the, of the, of the, of the ATM. And he said, yeah. you know, they'll have four or six of these fucking things in a row. Yeah. Well, yeah. Three. And, and yeah. so he, he said, what would happen is he would break in the night before, well, whatever weeks before, really, he would block off the sensors, like, you know, the motion detectors yeah. on the inside of the blank. He goes, they still work. He just block off block so he could off. drop down in, into the, in the bank. Yeah. And then he would go. And so the night before they would load the machines, he would go unlock the doors, pull out all the, all the money, go back up inside and then go back out. And he said, you know, if like the, uh, if the alarm got set off or something, which he said, I think almost never happened. He said, you know, the cops show up, they'll look in the, it's still window. secure. Yeah. They look around, they drive around, they'll yeah. sit outside for 30, 45 minutes. And yeah. Leave. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there, that there, reminded me of your thing is what, 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 when you, yeah, see- well, that's exactly what we're, so they have the same as you guys, the ones that stand alone, like in the yeah. hallway of a mall or the ones that are in a convenience store, but those are the private ones. Yeah. Yeah. When you get into the bank bank ones, the only time that you'll ever read anything about that is when they catch you, they will never say, Scotia Bank machine broken into fifty thousand dollars missing, blah blah. Because they don't want anyone to know it's that they're losing their shit. Yeah, right. The only time that we ever got any publicity was when they arrested us, right? Right. And then it was all blah 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 blah. We caught these guys, right? Well, how did you get onto this? What you were telling? I'm sorry, I kind of so, yeah. So I knew known these guys, and uh, I was friends with one of them, and. Uh, a specific holiday was coming up and he's like, Chris, are you interested in doing this with me? I'm like, yeah, all right, I'll give her a shot. So we did, we put a chain around the fucking thing, ripped it out. We got, we made I don't know, about $33,000 or something. I was like, fuck, that was pretty good. That was quick. It was easy. Right? How do you, what do you mean? Get it, wrap the chain around it. So you get a big, uh, Big thick chain. Is this a, a private one or a, this, a bank? No, this was a bank one, but it was in a gas station. Okay. Right? And so we put the chain around it. It's hooked to the vehicle. I ran, take a run at it, and it ripped it out. Came fucking full standard. Oh, it's just think I'm flying out of the fucking building, land in the parking lot. We fucking loaded it up. We were gone. So I was like, wow, that's fucking cool. That was easy. So then that guy, he How- wasn't really. What's that? I'm sorry. How'd you get into it? Like, did you pry it open? Like, uh, yeah, so a tracking what, device or anything? No, there was no GPS in it. No. So we, uh, well, obviously we, we left it in the vehicle and put it somewhere where we could sit for a while and watch it. Right. Make sure right. that nobody came and checked on it. Right. So we, the next day we took it to a shop and we took a quick cut to it, fucking cut it open and got the cases out and took the money and we're good to go. We, uh, I don't want to say how we no, got rid that, of it, but <laughs> I'm just I'm just curious. Okay. Yeah, right. So we did that. So I did that for uh, whatever we're not gonna say, right? But but it happened here and there, right? And uh, but it was always in the back of my mind. I'm like, this is a lot of work. I don't want to fucking rip it out and do. But what if that thing fucking hits me in the back of the head one day? Right? I had one one time we were with these. It was with two other guys, and we're lifting this thing. Now, that fucking machine probably weighs about a 1,000 pounds. It's a big safe that's with a computer on the top is what it, what it is, right? Yeah. So we, me and the two other guys, we're lifting this machine into a truck. Well, something had slipped. Well, the edge of the fucking machine had landed on my pinky finger and just, just crushed it. I actually went to my family doctor. I'm like, something's wrong with my finger. He sends me for an x-ray. He's like, something wrong with your finger. He says, it's fucking crushed. What did you do? I'm like, well, I dropped something on it. But you put a 1,000 pounds on it. Like it was right at the very corner. So it was like a sharp edge, right? It just crushed my finger. It literally was swelled up so fast. It just split the skin wide open. Mm. So, yeah, but it just doing that, it was like, this seems like a lot of work. Right. You know, if 
what if that machine something the chain snaps and something goes loose you fucking decapitate you like, who knows i'd rather just get into the machine take yeah. the money out and leave their shit there i don't want the machine right yeah. so that was always uh my goal was to be able to just get the money and leave everything else behind right yeah, obviously so yeah <laughs> <laughs> not, you're not collecting atm exactly you know you can only stick so many of them over a fucking bridge into a river before they start stacking up you know what right. i'm saying <laughs> so yeah um yeah there's a couple rivers with some piles at the sure. end of the rainbow so yeah um hmm so what so so the next step is you're figuring we gotta I figure don't out do this yeah, we got to figure out how to just get into these. So, okay, I got to tread lightly here. Um, it took some time. Definitely took some time. Um, I don't know if I can give details. Maybe we'll just stick with one day we figured it out. Right. We mastered the plan. Right. Right. Well, there's, there's other guys. There are guys out there. Like there's that, other like, guys doing it. The but, Blanchard guy, like I said, he actually had fucking figured out the key. You know, he's got but, different but, keys. But, but here's the problem. And I'll explain this to you. When shit went bad for us, they go on your MO, right? Yeah. So when, when they arrested us, I had to plead guilty to nine of them because even though we had masks on and they couldn't prove that it was us, it's called a statement of similar fact. So because that white car pulled up and two guys in mask got out and they had the same tool and they did everything the same way, we can say that it's them. Right. Even though you got a mask on and they can't prove that it's you. It's statement of similar fact is what they got. And my lawyers, they like, you're done. It's, you can't fight it. it. It's over. Right. So. So what's the most you ever got out of one of these things? Um, I just want to say I've got six digits multiple times. Okay. I don't want to give too many specifics because, yeah, you know. <laughs> but I've, I've got six digits multiple times. Um, but on average – you're between 30 and 60. I've got a few 70s, a few 80s, a few 90s, and six digits a few times. But for the most part, you're around between 30 and $50,000. Okay. Right? So, yeah. So you're doing this periodically. I mean, how are you guys hitting them like every week, every... Um, we were trying to be as sporadic. We didn't want to leave any trail that they could start to set something up. Right. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of worried. So we kind of jumped around from banks to banks, trying different styles, different ways, right. Just testing the waters on everything. Certain banks were, very lax on their security and other banks were got very uptight very quick on their security and took drastic measures very quickly like i can tell you one and it was they only lost about fifty thousand dollars before <laughs> they tightened the fucking strings real quick and there was other banks that lost millions and never did a fucking single thing to do anything about it. They would just wait till it was done and then they'd fix the problem. They would never go and do a preemptive strike to do anything to stop it, right? Right. So, yeah. It was it, it was interesting. Were How, you married at this time? Married girlfriend? God, no. Um yeah, I don't believe in marriage. Um girlfriend uh, yeah, yeah. I was with uh, my ex, Melissa, and she had my two stepdaughters. She have any any idea of what's happening, or you just come home every once in a while with a nice thick. Yeah, she she knew she had known me for a long time, so she knew that I was a, a criminal. I would never uh, give specifics as, as to exactly 
what I'm yeah. doing for a couple of reasons. One, I don't want it used against me later. And if she's being questioned, I don't want her to have enough information. I just want her to be able to play dumb, right? Yeah. So, yeah, she never really knew, but she knew that I'm a criminal and it is what it is. You know, your buddy comes and picks you up and then you come back with a pocket full of money. What what were you doing? Were you trying to, did you start, a, I mean, were you thinking to yourself like, hey, this is just, this is just what I'm doing from here on out? Or do you think? Yeah, hey, per, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. There was never much of a, an end goal because, you know, I had a lot of people that, you know, Chris, you gotta, you gotta save up and you gotta start a business and you gotta just, I'm like, that's you. I'm not a businessman. I'm a fucking thief. This is what I do. Right. So, right. <sighs> In hindsight, should I have did that? Obviously, I wouldn't be struggling like I am right now. Yeah. But you know what? I uh, I got a lot of friends that you know when I was younger, I had a I got a pretty uh, close group of friends still from high school, some from public school that were all still good friends. And you know when we were younger, these guys would be like, "Oh, Chris, you know you got to learn to settle down and fucking get married and." have kids and relax you know you're gonna end up old and lonely one day I, as my best friend old and lonely well now we're in our mid 40s and he's still with the same girl going to the same fucking job doing the same shit day in and day out and i did a lot of shit in my life and had a lot of fun I was like, how's that old and lonely and now it's like shut up <laughs> right i right. i did everything i wanted in my life like, traveling I, just, I did whatever i wanted i had everything so was it worth it? I don't know. Do you want to be the guy that goes to the same job, living in your little white picket fence and fucking banging the same broad the rest of your life? And that's not for me. I'm not that guy, you know? Yeah. I don't, you, you guys got Baskin Robbins ice cream down there? Yeah. Yeah. They got 31 flavors for a reason. Yeah. You don't go there and eat chocolate ice cream all the time. Right. Right. <laughs> you got to experience everything. So, I don't know, I just, I guess. Law enforcement often questions him, not because he's suspected of a crime, but because they find him fascinating. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. Yeah, that life's not for me. So it, it was worth it to have the public. There was nothing that I could never not do, right? The only th restrictions that were ever there was obviously going to the States. I'm not welcome there. So that took out some stuff. But like you had the money to do everything you ever wanted and get everything you ever wanted, right? So life was pretty good, and I did it while I was young, right? Or, uh, you know, it, all my friends, yeah, you got lots of money now in the bank, and you're going to be fucking loaded when you're 60 years old, but you're too old to do anything. You, you're not right. going to enjoy it. So what, what, what happened? I mean, I mean, you're ultimately, I mean, you got caught. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, in August of 2016, I had spent the whole summer up on my boat, living on my boat all summer. And I had come back to London one day to do something. And I was on my bike and I was out at my buddy's farm and we were fucking drinking a couple of bottles of whiskey and we were pissing around on the dirt bikes and ended up getting just hammered. Well, I don't know. I had come up with this bright idea that I was going to take my friend whose house I was at his wife and my best friend and his wife, we were going to meet in town. And I was going to grab this new girl that I was dating and take them out for dinner and introduce them. I don't know. I don't I have no recollection of any of this, but this is what I'm told. So it was about seven o'clock at night. And I went to leave. They, they took my fucking shit. They wouldn't let me get on my bike, right? They're like, no, we're driving you, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, whatever. They went in the house to grab his purse and keys and all that shit. Well, I guess I had dropped, jumped on my bike and fucking taken off. Well, they tried to follow me. So this is outside of the city, probably about 20 minutes, half route outside of town, right? So I take off. So they tried following me. And I guess I was just all over the road, weaving in and out of traffic and just stupid, right? Well, they lost sight of me. So I don't know exactly what happened, but at 1231 in the morning, I came to and I was laying in a field on my back. And I remember my first memory is yelling for help. 
yelling for the people that I know. And then I started to kind of clue in. I'm like, there ain't nobody fucking coming, Chris. You're in a goddamn field and you don't know where you are. Right. right. So I, I took my helmet off and grabbed my, cause I always put my phone in my inside pocket. So I grabbed my phone out and I turned, I powered it on cause it had shut off. And I called my girlfriend first and she's like, baby, where are you? I'm like, I don't fucking know. Why did I call you? You're useless. Right. So I hung out. I called my buddy whose house I'd left and I'm like, listen, I said, you got to come get me. I said, just start heading back to London on the main road. I said, just start beeping your horn. I'll let you know when I hear you. Right. So he's like, okay, he's he, him and his wife better driving around looking for me for hours. Right. I, but I don't really know what time it is at this point. I don't know anything. Right. I'm fucking right. just dazed still. So about 15 minutes later, I hear a horn in the background coming, right? So I'm like, okay, I can fucking hear you, bro. I can hear you. I can hear you. Well, I had left the town before London, and it was about a five-kilometer straightaway, and then there's a big sweeping turn. Well, I kind of made an attempt for the turn, but I didn't make the turn. And I come off the highway and down into a field, probably down about 15 feet, and the bike landed in the nose and i think my body must have came forward my knees caught the handlebars and i broke everything in both my knees and it obviously just catapulted me and flipped me and everything else and it was bad right so i was in a wheelchair for four months i had to learn how to walk again and everything else and at this time we had done all these machines that whatever it doesn't matter we had to switch things up. Let's just say that. Okay. So I had always heard about this specific tool that would just open them up quickly. It's a torch, right? Yeah. So I had heard about this thing. So I was like, well, you know what? I'm in rough shape. By this point, I've been in, hadn't really done anything in close to like eight months to a year. At that point, you know, I always had a hundred grand kicking around for a rainy day, whatever, right? Well, I had used that up being in the wheelchair. I still got expenses coming out my ass. You know, you're not thinking like, oh, that's the end of it right here. I got to conserve. You're still living life the way you are and you're in a wheelchair. So you're trying to probably compensate a little bit and, you know, right. Anyways, so shit's getting bad. So by Christmas time, I learned how to walk again and... We got arrested in May 4th or 5th or something like that. But in that meantime, we had got this new tool and we were practicing with it and trying to master the art of how to get in. Because you got to find the specific spot. You don't know. You're, you're, you're going in blind. You don't know what you're dealing with. So you right. got to try different shit. So in my mind, I'm trying to picture the inside of this door to see where the fucking weaknesses are off of what I've learned from other machines. Well, these ones weren't the same, right? The whole mechanism inside was different. So I got to one and I'm playing in my mind how a safe works and how the door goes and where the pins are going to be and this and that. So then the one out of these nine, it fucking worked. When we got like $32,000, like, okay, I got it mastered. I got it figured out. Now we're good. I know where everything's at. Go back out, fucking strike out, strike out. Well, I was with uh, my co-accused that I was with, and there may or may not have been another person with us in another vehicle. And so I have a question. Yep. You're just walking straight up to an ATM. No, no. And, and, and you're trying going to get in. in. You're going into the bank. Okay, so when you go, I don't know how your guys' branches are, but in Canada, when, I, when we go walk to the front door of the bank, you could go in. There's this, a room to the side with the ATM machines that you could go in and access, right? Like a salad and door. A, yeah, and then there's a locked door that goes into the bank, yeah. right? So yeah. we got to go. We got to go in that door into the bank, and then we got to go to the second door that goes into the room behind the machines, and that's where the safe is for the machines that are in the wall that you walk up to. Okay, so nobody can see you back there. So nobody, well, once you're in the bank and in that room, no one sees you. Yeah. But to get to there, yeah, people can see you, right? Okay. So, so we got to go through two locked doors, and then as soon as you open that second door, the alarm's on, right? So anyways, we're trying to, to figure this stuff out, 
Well, for some reason, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. So I'm just going to say for some reason, we decided to go past our rules of 5 a.m. and do it around, I think it was 1230 in the morning or something. Well, <laughs> it was a fucking Saturday night and the jurisdiction that we were in had a police helicopter and it was just so happened that he was up in the air at that exact moment. So when we went into the bank, we had set the door, the motion on the door to go into the room. And then once we put the heat to the safe, it fucking set the heat sensor off inside of the safe, right? And then there was a motion detector in that room too. So three alarms are going off. So they know that there's somebody in the room. It's not a false alarm on one thing. So they know. Yeah. And within the last, you know, 60 days, there have been eight other attempts. And this is number nine. And this is in the greater Toronto area, which is a city of like 3 million people or 4 million people or whatever, right? So they know that it's on. So the fucking helicopter just went Meh, and moved over on his little joystick and hovered over top of the bank. So we come out of the bank and we're getting away. We go through this subdivision. I pull up to a light and I'm, I said to my partner, I'm like, that's a cop right there. He's like, no, 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 relax. I'm like, that's a fucking cop, bro. We got to go. No, no, relax, relax. So I, unfortunately, I listened to him. Not that it would have mattered too much, but I listened to him. So I'm driving. Anyways, I got all the way up to the main highway. As soon as I got on the on-ramp, I fucking floor it. Well, sure enough, the lights come on. So we get into the chase. And at, by this point, I don't know that there's a helicopter on us, right? So we go on the highway and I come off the highway. And I'll, I'll send you the video so you get the link so you can see the full thing. But um, <laughs> anyway, I fucking blew the cops away. We're gone, right? My partner is watching out the back window. There's no cop in sight. There's no one near us. We're safe. So I go in, go through a bunch of streets and houses. I park in a fucking laneway. We get out. We hop in the backyard, sitting in the backyard. And all of a sudden, I can see the fucking lights bounce. There's a school behind us. I can see the lights from the cherries bouncing off the school behind us. I'm like, what the fuck, man? How do they know, right? It must just be random. Well, it ain't random. All of a sudden, I hear this noise. And I look up. There's a helicopter. Oh, fuck. I don't know how far up. But he's right above us hovering. And I'm like, oh, dude, we're fucked. It's over. We're done. And so, yeah, I, uh, I tried to run. If, when you see the video, you'll see me hobble over the fence. Yeah. Well, Durham Regional Police have released dramatic footage of a pursuit of two suspects in a break and enter at a bank. They just blew the lights at Highway 2, northbound on Harwood. I'm going to switch to two here. The police helicopter's night vision camera shows the dramatic chase through the streets of Whitby. Last Saturday at around 11.15 at night, police responded to an alarm at a Scotiabank. The helicopter follows the suspects and then, as they try to make their high-speed getaway, running red lights and blowing past other cars. Now, take a look. You can see the heat from the tires as the car makes its high-speed turns. The suspects would eventually dump the car in a driveway and then run off. Police arrested one suspect and a canine officer was able to track down the other suspect nearby. A 41-year-old man and a 51-year-old man now face a total of 21 charges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny that anybody that knew me because my legs didn't really bend then, so you can see the way I was running. It was pretty odd. They're like, oh, we know that was you, right? So then they took me down to the ground and punched my fucking face in and arrested me and charged me with nine bank machines and uh, high-speed chase. And I ended up getting three and a half years for that. Mm. So, and and yeah. you do how much time on three, three and a half, on three I years? I did uh, two and a half of the three, three and a half. Really? Years. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. So, so you, in, you in, have... in Canada on, well, on, on any time you do two thirds and then the last third is a uh, good time basically um in the provincial system it's good time so they could take your good time for to get into a fight or whatever they could take that away the federal system it's not it's called uh statutory release at two-thirds you're released on parole and then you got conditions so you got to see a parole officer and go through all the fucking bullshit get a job and do all that stuff right yeah it's similar here like well not the two-thirds but here you have to do 85 percent of your time 
And then when you get released, they, they call it supervised release. Yeah. And you get, you know, like I got, I got five years supervised release. So everybody's like, Oh, you got out of prison. You're done. No, I'm no, not. you're not. That, that's even worse. It, yeah. For, for me, I'd rather be in the prison than being out here. Like if you're no. going to lock me up, lock me up. Don't fucking sit there and tease me with it because I don't want to be sitting at home with a nine o'clock curfew while my friends are out having fun and getting fucked and partying and drinking and being at the bar and having a good time while I'm sitting here. Because guess what? I ain't sticking around. I'm coming. Right. Uh, That's just the person that I am. Right. So I don't do well on that type of stuff. But that yeah. last one, all my stuff, I've always breached a million fucking things. Every, I've always breached everything. But my last one, I actually, believe it or not, completed the full parole. And my parole officer, my last day, I had to go see him for the last time. And he called me a statistical anomaly. <laughs> you know, What's that? You know, Boziak? Yeah, I know who he is. Yeah. He's never, he's never successfully completed a probation Anything. ever. Yeah. I've, I've, I mean, he's been on it fucking five, four, five, six times. I've oh, never yeah. been able to complete it. Yeah, no, I've never completed one without having a fuck up until this last one, parole. My uh, my first time when I was 18 and I got out, I went back. Well, I think I only went back on one parole violation. My second time I went to the pen, I got two years. I went back on two violations on that one. And then this one, I got none. I finally finished it because... In Canada, prison just, it ain't like it used to be. Not that prison was a good place to be, but right. it was tolerable, right? There was good people in there. You know, you could have fun. Basically, in prison, well, you don't need me to tell you. Anything that you got on the street, pretty much, you can get in there. You know, you want to get drunk and have a party, you can make fucking booze, get a party. You want to get high, you can get high. You want to get a piece of ass, you can get trailers. Like, you can work around pretty much every obstacle and get what you want. Right. So it wasn't so bad. But now the prison is just full of drug addicts, losers. And there's nobody to sit there and talk with and have a, an intelligent conversation, really. I mean, you can find the odd guy, but there's not much. Right. Yeah. It's just it's a, it's a whole different thing. And it's not a place that I really uh, want to spend a whole lot more time in my life. So I just uh, I wrote out that parole and now I'm just uh, trying to unfortunately work for a living and pay my bills not a big fan of it but it is what it is <laughs> um i'm gonna listen that guy gerald blanchard right yeah um uh hold on fraud i'm gonna go with fraud bro i'm gonna send you the wired article on him yeah i'm telling you your story was is almost like a combination of his story and Boziak's story, like okay. with you and being a kid in and out of the facilities, in and out, in and out. Yep. And yours with the the ATMs and everything. Yep. Same kind of stuff. I mean, I'm sure there's tons where, of stuff. You, you where was he with. in Canada? Do you know? Bro, I mean, Canada. Um, like, was he in Ontario? Here. Was he out west? Mm, I'm, I, I just hit the – here's the Wired article. Um Blanchard. Yeah. <coughs> Listen, he's got a great story. Um, so let me think. What um shit, I can't. You gotta look it up. I, I don't know exactly where he where he was, but I'm telling you, I'm gonna send it to you right now. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna read it and be like, holy shit, like you got some good stuff in there. Um hold on. Well, maybe I can put it together for the next fucking stab at it. Yeah. The, the <laughs> only, thing, only thing is, you know what he did? He actually was in, um, I want to say Vienna. Hold on. I'll tell you right now. He was in, where was he? Um, oh, man. I wish I had thought about this better. I want to say, You're I'm going to say Vienna. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Your connection's going all weird. Oh, sorry. I think yeah. he was in Venice or something. Not Venice, uh, Vienna. Anyway, yeah, I'll know for sure. But what he did was he actually, you know, you know how a lot of in Europe they'll take old castles and turn them into museums. Jason, no, it's okay. It, you, oh, there we go. Yeah, you know how in in oh. Europe they'll they'll Perfect. take old castles 
and turn yep. them into and turn them into museums. Yep. He'd gone through a museum and realized that like it had really bad security. And so he ends up getting someone to drop him at night and he parachutes down, skydives down and lands on the roof. Nice. And he goes in the second story window and he steals what's called the cis diamond. Okay. And it's a, it's a diamond. It's a massive diamond surrounded by other diamonds. Yep. Never does anything with it. Just keeps it. Keeps it. Because he, he, he you know, he could have broke it apart and sold it, but sold it. yep. But he, he, he just didn't, he, has it. He just wanted to see if he could do it. You know, do he it. didn't have the money. Yep. And ultimately, when he gets caught by in Canada, um, when he gets caught, he uses that to bargain his way out of getting. Yeah, yeah, you could do that in Canada. Yeah, yeah they call it doing patches. I used to do that. I've done it three or four times, believe it or not, with stolen vehicles. Right, because they uh, <laughs> they don't like it very much. Right, but I'm not there to please them. But the thing is, is the in Canada, the auto theft squad for the police is financed by the insurance companies. Right, they give them a lot of money to stop combat auto theft. Right, really. So when you you call for something, you're not going to really buy your way out of anything bad. But yeah. if you get some stupid little shit, and you know you got a hundred thousand dollar car sitting somewhere, well. Your lawyer will go to the crown and say, hey, listen, my guy wants to give you this back. You drop this. Well, no, we don't want to do that. No? Okay. Lawyer calls up the insurance company. Hey, my client has $100,000 worth of your stuff, and the crown doesn't want to get it back for you. Oh, really? And the fucking insurance company forces them to fucking do yeah, it. They get phone calls that the fuck are we funding you for? Exactly. Hey, they get so pissed. I read about another Canadian that was making U.S. money. Do you ever hear about that guy? He was a, he was counterfeiting U.S. money. Um, um, I, I've heard of a few counterfeiters. Was, I think he was in GQ. I think he might have been in GQ. And I read about him. There's a YouTube a video on YouTube oh, about him. It's a short little video. I think he, that's the kid from fucking uh, Windsor. I believe it was just a young I, kid. Uh, no, this kid he was he was he was old, short, fat. He was not a, a oh. not a what? Trust me, he was. He was oh. a tubby little guy. Oh, okay. but there was, a, there was a young kid oh. from Windsor that stumbled upon that at a young age, and he actually works for the federal government now. Well, this guy, when he got caught, he got caught, and he was going to get a whole bunch of time. And the big thing they held over him was they were going to – like he was like he was thinking, okay, big deal. I'll get a year or two yep. in Canada. I was making U.S. currency. Well, so the Secret the Service comes in. Yep. And they said, we're going to ex extradite, extradite you to the U.S. Yeah. So he turns around and he goes to the Canadians, you know, to the crown and said, listen, I'll tell you where where the press is, yeah. where the paper is, where uh, he had like a, I don't say, all, yeah. mil several million dollars already made. I'll yeah. give you several million, but you cannot send me to the United States. Yeah. Because he knew they were going to give him 10 or 15 years. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. So, That's, that, that, our di justice systems are totally different, right? Like they fucking hang you guys down there where we don't get that here. Yeah, it's it's right? it's outright. And of course, every time you get in trouble, you're gonna get even more time the next time. That's not always true, right? No, no, like, I'm saying here for us. Here, oh yeah, 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 for sure. For right. sure. Like Canada, my, I was gonna like say that. my crime. So let's say for half a million dollars. The first time, if you ever get in trouble, never been in trouble in the federal system, you could probably get six months, yeah, in, in jail. The second time, you're probably getting three or at least three years, maybe more, maybe four. Yeah. The third or fourth time, you're probably going to get 10, 15 yeah. uh, years. I know a guy who'd been locked up like seven times. He's off what's called the criminal history chart. Yeah. He's off the chart for $80,000. They gave him six, I think almost 20 years. Yeah. For 80 grand. Yeah. It's yeah. nothing. You give me 20 years for 80,000? They're like, yeah, but we're tired of locking you up. Yeah. Well, I've seen guys up here doing, you know, seven, eight years for a couple hundred bucks just doing stupid shit. But that's violence, right? Yeah. Well, that, but, yeah. yeah. This was fraud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fraud. Yeah. But see, in Canada, so for your shit, it wouldn't matter whether it was a couple of million or fucking 20 million. Your first time. Well, I mean, you get up that high, you would go to jail your first time. If you got caught doing a half a million, Maybe now they're starting to get a little bit harder on the sentencing, but 15 years ago, like when I did my first 
pen bit. Buddy had stole like $10 million and he got two years. If you had stolen a few hundred thousand dollars for your first time, you'd probably get probation. You wouldn't go to jail, right? Mm -hmm. If you got a good pre-sentence report and you got a good family and everything behind you, you wouldn't even go to jail. Uh, I knew a guy who got 15 years for in the, in the federal government, right? He was Canadian. Yeah. He was Canadian, but he got caught in the United States for a few million dollars. He got like 15 years. He had a friend that did the same scam in Canada. Yeah. He got, I want to say he got three years and they let him do almost the whole sentence like at his house on home on like a home, like he had a house, a, arrest. A house arrest. Yeah. And here's the thing too. Like you understand once you get arrested in the United States and they let you out and you have to show up, but let's say they put you on house arrest. Like yep. they don't consider that part of your time. Oh really? Yeah. So I could be on house arrest while I'm waiting to be sentenced for a year. They don't, that's not part of your time. Oh yeah. 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 That's like, it's like that here. But oh, okay. if, if you're, if you're on strict conditions, they don't have to, give you credit for it but i've seen where they will give you credit if you're on strict conditions i've seen them knock time off for guys but they don't have to it's not considered doing time but house arrest like i'm on house arrest right now for a driving charge because i'm disqualified for driving for life right and i got caught riding a, my motorcycle a year and a bit ago so i'm doing four months house arrest right now for driving but that's what a house arrest is an actual sentence Right, yeah, you go to court right. and you get sentenced. Yeah. Um. Well, now wait a minute. You can do house arrest in the federal system if it's your sentence. It can sentence you to that. So yeah, I, I meant when you're being when you're waiting for. Well, you're for waiting for tri- and you're on bail. Well, yeah, I knew bond a, for you guys is bond, but we're we're right. in bail here, right? Like I knew a guy in in uh, London. He was arrested. Sorry, in the UK, he was arrested. And so he's arrested and they put him on house arrest. And he said, I was allowed to go to war. He's allowed to do anything, but he said, you got to call in and tell him, Hey, yeah. this is what's going on. He said, yeah. well, he held it huddled off his sentencing for like a year or two. And so when he finally he got sentenced, up. they used, they counted all of that towards his sentence. Nice. He said, I basically went in, got processed, stayed for whatever, a couple of days. And then they yeah. basically just let him go. Done. Yeah, nice. I was like, that's ridiculous. And he was like, yeah, yeah. no doubt. Yeah, that'd be nice. Well, I'm a, like, I'm on house stress. I'm allowed to leave for work, right? Yeah. And then uh, Saturdays, I got four hours to go and do the stuff that I got to do. And uh, my probation officer let me uh, take my stepdaughter down to um, the park for the uh, Remembrance Day. Thing remembrance do day? Down the remembrance day november 11th you guys don't do remembrance day no for the veterans when the oh, war veterans day. Off, veterans day yeah yeah oh we, well we don't remember it day here. yeah oh okay yeah november 11th so they always do a ceremony right so anyways i like to take my kids i've always taken my kids to go down and see that stuff so she let me go and take my stepdaughter down for that because i think it's important that your kids know that stuff and Right. Right. So she let me do that. So yeah, it's not house rest. It's not the end of the world. It's not the best, but this this cell's nicer than uh the cells in the jail, that's for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, they said the 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 best day the worst day out here is better than the best day in there. Exactly. Exactly. Listen, I sent you a couple of things on that guy on Gerald Blanchard. I'm telling you, you gotta read that article. You I gotta, will, you for gotta... sure. <laughs> trust me. You don't have to tell me twice. Yeah, I'll be it's, on it's, it. it's pretty interesting. I'm curious to see where he was from because I don't uh, – Blanchard, Blanchard. Hmm. Winnipeg, born oh, in 2007 in, in Winnipeg. Yeah, okay. Yeah. He's in Man- Manitoba. That's why I'm not familiar with him. If he was in Ontario, I would probably know the guy. But um, Convicted, 2007, theft and fraud. He got eight years – uh, he was paroled two years after. Yeah. Yeah, that day parole. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think he's been in trouble since then for something stupid. Oh, probably, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, then, yeah, here it is. Gerald Blanchard, 
Canada's craftiest robber is back in the news. This is 2017. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm telling you, you, you got to read like you, you could, you could write up your story the same as, as his. It's very similar story. Yeah. <laughs> very. Cause, and you know, he gets into all kinds of little interesting, you know, how it is when you're doing, you know, fucked up shit. You're always doing something crafty. You're always, Oh, you always got to be crafty. Listen, you're always pushing I, the envelope. I've come up with a lot of different ways to get shit logistically. Right. Like I've made, uh, I've made tripods to put up on the roof of a building with a pulley system to get all the shit out and then bring it to the edge of the building and then steal a cube van and cut the roof out of the fucking cube van, pull the fucking cube van up, throw everything into the cube van and <laughs> jump off the roof into the pile of shit and then drive away. Right. You know, there was, you know, another thing that it reminds me, this reminds me of, there was a, a couple, a bunch of bank robbers that were doing the same thing. They were going and they were taking, you know, that, that great stuff, that foam. Yeah. So they would go in on banks and they would foam the 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 alarm bells the alarm. on the roof. Yeah. So they would go in there and they'd fill it up with foam and they'd wait for it to and that way when it went off, it didn't make it a noise. Yeah. Yeah. Then they'd, they'd cut through the roof, open the roof, and they set the alarms off. And they wait. Yep. They'd wait for the cops to show up. Yep. And Come then they alarm. Cops would go in. They're like, they don't hear an alarm. It's yep. You know, they'd look in the windows. They'd be like, everything's fine. And then when they left, they'd jump, drop down, do it go again. in, and they'd cut into the fucking vault and steal. And, and they had, you know, they were safe crackers and the whole yeah. thing. Oh, is that those guys out of Youngstown, Ohio? I think so. Yeah, they eventually catch them. Yeah, um, I was just watching them. Fuck, what's his name? But, I mean, you have – I'm saying that you the, – the combination – what I'm saying is you've got aspects of multiple stories. Yeah, yeah. That are no not necessarily any more ingenious or better or worse than your story. The difference is they're put together. Put together, yeah. You have to you, you have to be able to put all that together to to make things work, right? Yeah, but you got to no no no. I mean, you have to write it down. I have to write it down. Your story isn't written down. You should write right. your story down, even well, if it's the problem with that is, and like I said to you before, I can't talk about a lot right well, then you, I then you also, like my mom my mom bugged me to write a book forever i'm like mom i can't talk about this stuff yeah i think that that no that i think you can you can alter certain things you don't have to give the names of banks you can alter certain uh certain things you can give more generalities and the Your things that you've been convicted of you show more specifics there's yeah. lots of things in my book that i talk I generally I about understand. i can't even understand can't, what you're saying Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. So there are things in my book that I talk about in general generalities where yeah, I'm yeah. very it not because I'm afraid I'm going to get caught for anything, mm. but what I'm concerned about is that, you know, I don't I didn't want my book to just be crime, 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 you know. You want to have a story with it as well. Right. So I want to tell what's going on with me personally, personally and the girl yeah. that I'm saving. And yep. of course, what my crimes are. And sometimes I would take a whole bunch of them and I'd say, you know, like I tell one story about an, an interesting fraud. And then I'd say, you know, and over the next six months, you know, I did various other frauds and pulled in another two point five million dollars. And yeah. then I just keep going like, OK, I didn't tell anything specific about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, so you just tell about the ones that are super interesting. <laughs> yeah. And if you're saying Hey, yeah, but I don't, maybe I wasn't caught for this one. And it is super interesting, but I wasn't caught. Well, then you change the name of the change, bank and maybe. Change, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Change a few things. Yeah. Yeah. You alter it and you can tell the reader, look, I'm altering some of these events just because I don't want it to. <laughs> don't you know, feel like going back to prison. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I've really? done enough time. Yeah. But exactly. o overall, I don't think the 100% specifics are as important as, as the important general as the story. story. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So when are we going to start writing? I mean, write an outline. <laughs> you got to write an outline. Listen, I'm working on three stories right now. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. What yeah, is it? I'm how? What's the? What does it take you to do one? Roughly, what is it um, a year, it two-year ordeal. If it's a synopsis of a story, like so, a book. So, so let's say it's a book. Like a book. A book would probably take six months. Six months, maybe eight months. Okay. 
if I, you know, because a lot of it is research. Yeah. Now a regular story, which is all you really need, which is like a synopsis of a story. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like maybe the size of a newspaper article or twice that size, oh, like, okay. like in a magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a book is typically about 80 to 90,000 words. Let's say, let's say 70 to 90,000 words. Yeah. A story is about, you know, synopsis of a story is maybe 10,000 words. Yeah. Okay. You know, I have some that are nine. I have some that are 12 or 13, ru roughly. Yep. yep. Gotcha. Okay. So, and you then, know, that, that's all you need. And then where is that going to? Like I put them on my website and then yep. when other producers and directors and things go, they look at my stories. Pull up. And yeah. See. And then I have something to point to. Like I'll say, somebody will contact me about a story mm. and I'll say, um, yeah, you know, that story has been optioned. I have an, wh what are you looking for? I have another one that's similar and I'll say, go to my website. Here's the name of the story or I'll send it to them. You know, I'll, I'll yep. text, I'll send them the link and then they read it and they'll come back and go, holy shit. Like, you know, this is a great story. Like mm -hmm. Boziak's story was optioned. Um, yeah. Uh, Rossini, this guy, Pete Rossini's story was optioned. Um, oh God, what's his name? Um, God, uh, 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 the guy, um, there's a guy who uh, was on uh, vice. There's a one that's on, um, shoot, uh, was in, I got some guys in Rolling Stone magazine. I've got, I've got multiple stories yeah. that, you know, so my thing is, you know, once one of them takes, you only need one story to take off. Of course. Yeah. And then suddenly everybody's going and checking out your other oh, stories. And they're like, yeah, Holy. Yeah. so, you know, like if you were interested in writing your outline and, and trying to turn the whole thing into a, a story, the basic types of stories are on my website. My website's inside truecrime.com. Okay. I'll look it up. I haven't looked at that. I've watched a lot of the videos. You know what? To be honest with you, I haven't watched any of your podcasts. I've watched you on other people's stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, you gotta but, you gotta yeah. watch my stuff. But but yeah, I will, I will. But I, I just got I just kind of got into all this stuff like literally, and then I just I don't know something just told me to contact you the one day right. Yeah. I like, look, I just gotta see where this goes, you know. Well, so, if you go I, to if you go to Inside True Crime and look at the stories, I will. Yeah. You can read them, but I also have auditor, uh, audible versions too. So okay. you can click, there's a button you can click and it'll, it'll take you to YouTube. And so it's narrated. Somebody reads it to you. They're all about an hour long. Okay. All right. That's all you need. Yeah. You don't, I'm not saying write a whole fucking book. I'm saying write your story in a way that you can then, you know, I'll put it on the website. Like if it's good enough, I'll put it on the website and we'll get yeah. it narrated. And then it's, it's at least it's available. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. <clears throat> but I'm working on three of them right now. I'm cool. trying to finish my girlfriend's story. I'm working on a computer chip heist story where these Chinese guys are breaking into uh, um, manufacturing plants here in the United States, uh, stealing yeah. chips. And then I'm working on another story um, about a lawsuit. There was a guy out of California that was doing that years ago. <laughs> it's funny because you're going to know what I'm talking about. You uh, mentioned that Masterminds fucking show. One time yeah. on the podcast. Yeah. Remember there was that kid out of uh, California that was breaking into the Silicon Valley factories and stealing That's the chips. This was. That's what this guy was doing. Yeah. Get a whole That's crew it. of guys. They would go in like fucking seven, eight of them at a time. Yeah. And well, they, this was back in like the nineties. I think when this guy was doing it, this was, well, then it's probably the same guy. What's his name? Um, his name, Nothing, remember, but was he on masterminds? No, I mean he's in prison for life. His name, his last name was Long. Um, did he uh, have? A, did Han he Long. have? A, did he have? A, oh, it's Asian. That's right. Yeah. No, no these guys are all Asian. They're all tri triad white. members. Okay, this was a white guy, and I specifically remember because he had a custom-made aluminum ladder that he could use to come up to the building, and then once he got up, he'd pull the ladder back up behind him, and then he was mm -hmm. on the roof. To drop in to the fucking uh, the locked areas wherever they were inside of that building and steal them. That's what he was stealing the computer chips and all that stuff. Now these guys are going in. And these guys are fucking taking over. They're zip tying everybody. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, these are hardcore. Yeah. This was yeah. military precision. Yeah, but they ain't playing. That's when you're gonna. That's when you're doing big time. I'm but not. That's when you end up with a life sentence. Too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. I I always never down for that i didn't i don't want to have people around right i don't want to fucking steal from anybody like i don't 
when I was younger, I did some stupid shit, breaking into houses and stuff like that. But after that time, I went to prison and learned how to do B and E's properly. I never did any of that stuff again. I don't want to victimize people. I don't want someone sitting in their house scared. Plus, there's a lot more money in a fucking business than there is a house. Yeah. Right. I make a lot. Like I'm there for the money. I'm not there to take control of people or hurt people or nothing like that. I just want the money, man. It's just a, it's the life for me, right? Right. So I, I didn't want to. Didn't want to do that. So. And I didn't want the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so the whole point of this is to fucking it. get out and enjoy my life, not sit in, sit in prison. I mean, yeah, I did lots of time in prison, but I tried to do as little as possible. The law is a lot. They're more okay. They're a lot more understanding of you breaking into a business Isn't at it? night when it's closed and you breaking into somebody's house when they oh, could God, be yeah. there. Well, in, I don't know how your guys' laws are, but in Canada, you can get life in prison for a residential break-in whereas a commercial break-in the maximum is 14 years not that you ever get 14 years for it but that's the maximum right yeah here they call it it's a home invasion just a break-in is a home invasion yes here home home invasion is when the people are home and you go in and tie them up and take them over if break no, no. It, you just break in when they're no one's home and you just do that. Mm, yeah, they'll call it, it, it burglaries when nobody's home. When someone's home, I think they call it they'll, they'll typically consider it a home invasion. Oh yeah, it. if someone's home here, same thing, home invasion. No. But if, yeah. if no one's home, it's just a, a break and enter, a burglary, right? Mm. Um. All right. So what are you doing now? So uh, like I said, I just uh, doing renovations. I have. Uh, a good friend of mine right now, his house burnt down two years ago. So I'm just uh, helping him get his house built. I'm just over there helping with the contractor and just trying to get him moved. I just finished a bathroom for my buddy's wife. So yeah, I'm just kind of working and sucks. I hate it. Fucking hate working for a living. This is the whole reason I chose this lifestyle from a kid. I didn't want to do it. And now 45 years old and I'm being forced to do it. And I fucking hate every minute of it. <laughs> but I mean, you know, what? I don't, I don't look over my shoulder every day. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So I, I don't know <laughs> what I like more. <laughs> it's, it's nice to be able to not have to worry, but it sucks. There's no money. There's no money in working for a living. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, when you, when you're used to having, you don't need me to tell you. Right, you're used to having money for whatever the fuck you want and doing whatever. Yeah, but it it like you said, it's nice not looking over your shoulder. I didn't really look over my shoulder, but it it it's nice, you know. You know, you don't have to worry about just things in general, and 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 you know, it, you get a routine and you enjoy the smaller things in life and watch TV, and you know, it's 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 okay. It's good. It's good. I'm happy. Well, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad you are because I'm fucking miserable. <laughs> I hate every goddamn minute of it. Basically, I, was, I got my friend here is helping me with all the tech stuff, and I said to him, "I'm like, I'm basically being forced into retirement just for the simple fact I don't have anyone to work with." Right. That's why I'm doing it. I well, I mean, everybody. You everybody sounds like every time something one of your buddies got caught, they immediately rolled over on. No, them. not every time, but there was a couple. But I just. Like the, the whole world is fucking whacked out on fentanyl or crystal meth now. Like there is no good criminals out there that has a brain in their head. Like I need someone with a brain in their fucking head. Like there's a reason why the only way that I have ever got caught is red handed. I don't I've never had a co- cop come bang on my door and go, hey, uh, you left the fucking fingerprint here. We're coming and arresting you for this. Right. right. If you don't catch me red handed, you ain't getting me. Right. I don't fucking leave traces like when we were doing the bank machines. Right. I there was one crew of people and I I followed them through the news. And when they got caught, I was like, how did these guys get fucking caught? Right. And I followed, followed. And they were sending a girl in to scope out the bank. Right. To, To see the machine and see where. So every time this machine, one of these machines got hit they'd roll the cameras back and they'd always see this girl going in a day or two or three days before or whatever. Right. So they track, find out who she was and that all led back. Well, what the fuck do I need to look at the bank machine for? They're all the same. Yeah. I don't need to go in and look at the fucking thing. I know it's there. Right. I don't need to go in and look. I need to 
plan my escape route to the highway without being caught on a fucking camera and where I'm going to switch my vehicles without being seen. And that's where I got to spend my time. Right. So that some cop doesn't come banging on my door later going, Hey, we got your license plate here. Well, you were doing this. Da, 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 right. That's where all my time was spent was doing shit like that. Making sure I'm getting away. Did you ever hear about, there was a book, uh, um, there was a book called flawless and it was about a, a diamond heist in um, Antwerp. And the guys got away. It was flawless. It was a seamless uh, heist. It was amazing. They got away with, it was like the largest diamond heist in history. Yeah. Amazing. You know what they did? Oh. When they cleaned out their place. Where they were all staying, because none of them were, were, were anywhere from uh, even that the, the, the country. When they yeah. cleaned out their their place, they put it in a bag, and they were they like they had eaten, they they'd eaten like hamburgers or something, whatever, or sandwiches, yeah. and their fingerprints were on the sandwiches. They I'm threw sure everything that. in a bag, driving down their uh, down the street to the airport, yeah. threw the bag out there. Window. Window. Happened to be a yeah. reserve. And the guy that maintained the reserves walked outside, Watch. saw the bag, yeah. was opening up the bag and looking through all the garbage, pissed off that someone would have so littered. littered. Yeah. And while he's watching, looking at all this stuff, he sees the TV um, talking about this massive diamond heist. Yeah. And how in the diamond heist, they'd stolen all of the tapes, the videotapes of the heist. Yeah. Yep. And sure enough, in the bag are all the videotapes. Videos, no. He calls yeah. the police and says, I think this is maybe connected. Uh-huh. Fuck. It's just a one stupid mistake. Yep. Well, that's it, like uh, those guys that you were talking about that did the Youngstown. They did the safe in California, right? These fucking guys, all the work and everything that they put into it, they used their own fucking goddamn identification to get on a plane to go from Ohio to California. They use right. their own name and then the dishwasher. The right? dishwasher. Yeah. Left their fucking shit. The dishwasher didn't press Wait, clean. The, oh the, guy hit, the guy, like he, it later, they said that he hit the button. It just didn't come didn't on. Come like he on. didn't know how to run it. <laughs> that's horrible. See, that's what, for me, that's the shit that nightmares are made of. Yeah. Right. And I don't leave that stuff. I spend the time going through that over and over and over and over. To Say, make sure listen, that shit like that don't happen. Same thing with me. W my whole thing kind of came unraveled when I sent a girl into a title company to sign a dot sign for a bunch of loans. Yeah. And it was her picture on the ID. It's her picture. Yeah. But because she changed the color of her hair. Yeah. I never you watch the video. Yeah. The, the, the title so person different. said, I don't think this is you, yeah. but it was her. It was her. And that, that just because that title person had made a mistake, mistake, yep, she started making phone calls, and the whole thing came unraveled. Yep. Like, how do you account for that? You can't. You can't. Well, that's like the house arrest that I'm on for right now. How do you account for this one? My buddy calls me. It was the August long weekend. The year, not that some of the past, the one before that. My buddy calls me. He's like, "Hey, yo, bro, come see me." Blah blah blah. So. I go, I leave my boat. I live on my boat all summer, right? I fucking leave my boat. I go up to the town that he's in. I meet him at the Tim Hortons. He's like, okay, I just got to go over to this place over here. Follow me, and then we'll go back to my house. I'm like, okay, so I'm following him. Well, doesn't this car start following us? I'm like, well, what the fuck's going on here? It can't be me, obviously, yeah. right? They don't know who I yeah. am. So he's following me. So my bunny pulls into where he's going. Well, he's the fucking drug dealer so I, he, I don't know what he's doing but he's obviously doing something so i'm like i'm just gonna drive around the block see what happens well this car's following me that fucking long weekend i've been drinking and partying and i don't know where i am it's nighttime i got bad eyes to begin with well this car's fucking following me so i blast through a stop sign it's right behind me on my ass so i'm trying to get away but it's not working out so well and i'm like this person's gonna fucking smash into me sure enough i'm coming up to the street and i can see the dead end sign at the end i'm like Fuck, I'm doing about 120. Boom, into my back tire. The bike starts going side to side. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Why is this person doing this? So I go up to the dead end, and there's a street to the left. So I turn, I make the turn, and it's just a little, like, five houses on a little court. So I'm like, fuck. So I tried to put the bike between a house and the and the, and the the fence to try to get through. Maybe I can get through and get away from this person. They're trying to kill me. That's what I'm thinking in my head, right? 
So it doesn't work out. The fucking fence in the house narrows down. I hit the air conditioner, fucking crash. These two people get out and they're fucking beating me. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? They're like, you stole my friend's motorcycle. And I'm like, what the fuck? What? What are you talking about? That's my friend's motorcycle. I'm like, no, that's not. That's my fucking bike. Right? No, it's not. It's my friend's. I'm like, no, it's not. They fucking call the police. Right? Well, I'm disqualified for life from driving. Right? Oh, so that, the, that's fucking, how you... the fucking cops show up. They're like, what's going on? I'm like, I have no fucking idea, man. But all I know is that bike right there is mine. I own that. I said, other than that, I don't know what the fuck's going on here. You tell me. Talk to these fucking retards that just smashed me off the fucking road and punched my face in. Right? It's an off-duty fucking jail guard from one of the fucking jails here. Thought that I had stole their friend's bike. So the owner, before the police show up, they got me there. And the owner shows up. He's a fireman. He gets out of his truck. He's like, are you fucking stupid, mate? And I'm like, why don't you shut your fucking mouth and go look at the bike? He goes in the backyard. He comes back. He's like, uh, that's not my bike. I'm like, yeah, no fucking shit. He said, you just fucking tried to kill me. And guess who goes to jail? You. <laughs> me. What the fuck happened to them? Nothing. Right? How do you account for that? Yeah. I'm fucking minding my own business on my bike. And this fucking whack job. And this is an officer of the fucking law that should know better, you would think. Right? Mm. Yeah. I, I, I can tell you, I got a lot of stories like shit like that. That just, it happens to me, man. I'm one of those fucking guys. Like, how do you account for that? You can't account for that shit. But having a lifetime fucking driving ban, I'm going to jail for it. And at first, they wanted 18 to 24 months. When why I, do, you, why do you have a lifetime ban? Well, I never ever in my life got a license because it got suspended when I was 14 years old, right? And I remember I was 14, just a punk kid, right? And the judge is like, yeah, we're going to suspend your license for two years, whatever the fuck it was. And I'm like, well, are you going to suspend something that I don't got? And he says, right. well, now you can't get it, right? And I'm like, fuck. So then I was – this was – before this is when well, I was 14 years old, probably just before I started getting when I before I got caught. And my mom, I remember her saying to me, She's like, There's no fucking way. Well, I ever let you drive one of my cars because I was a bit of a fucking wild kid, right? So my right. mom, being the bitch that she is, would, Oh, you're never going to drive my car. Well, fuck it. I'll just steal them then. You're not going to let me fucking do something properly like most parents would do help your kid get a car and learn to drive. Oh, my douchebag mom, she's like, no, you're not driving my stuff. Perfect. All right, fuck you. Yeah. I'll just steal cars. So I started stealing them, and then everything escalated, so I was never able to get it, right? It was always suspended, always suspended. And then after so many driving without a license, well, now they start drive, putting you under suspension. So now you get so many driving under suspensions, and then it goes to disqualified. Well, now you're disqualified means the judges told you, you can't fucking drive. It's against the rules. Now you start doing jail time. There's guys that I've seen guys do time in the federal penitentiaries and doing more time than I got for those nine break and enters on banks mm. for driving a fucking car and pulling over. That's not getting into a high speed chase. Nothing. That's just pulling over and driving a car. That's how bad Canada is for fucking driving. It's insane. They wanted, when I got this one, they started out, my lawyer got the crown screening form and they said high reformatory, which is 18 to 24 months. She's like, she's called the crown. She's like, how the fuck do you justify that? The last one that he got was 60 days. How do you go from 60 days to 18 to 24 fucking months for a driving, right? And she got them down to six months and they would not budge under six months and my lawyer when i got my pre-sentence report i got a really good pre-sentence report and the lawyer's like listen should i think i can get you four months house arrest for this i'm like well if you think you can do it fucking do it right and so when i went up in front of the judge the judge is like well mr stevenson he's like uh i personally feel that if i put you in jail for six months like the crown is asking that's just gonna put you backwards from everything that you've obviously accomplished by finishing your parole, being out, not getting in any trouble, you know, working and doing everything. He says to put you in jail is just going to take all that backwards. So he gave me house arrest so that I could stay home and continue working. And I got my two sons that live with me. Right. So I got to be here for them. And so that's, yeah, that's how I got that. But other than that, like 
I would never have got house arrest. I've never had a sentence like this in my fucking life, man. I get, I'm lucky. I, I get bail once in a while. I barely get bail. I get arrested for something. I usually got to sit in jail and fucking ride it out while court's happening, right? Because our bail system is different than you guys down there. You guys down there are just a matter of how much the bond is, right? It's yeah. not like that here. You got to go in front of a judge and fight your case and be in the record that I have. With all the fucking breaching this and that and this and that, they don't want to give you bail, right? So I usually I'm always stuck inside. But things have lightened up in Canada recently, and they don't want people in jail so much anymore. So if you don't have anything outstanding and you just get caught for something, you're pretty much guaranteed they release you right away. Now, if you, like if if something happened to me right now while I'm on house arrest, then I'd be stuck. I'm in jail. Yeah. There's no getting out of that, right? Well, listen, you got anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> you don't got time. I could talk for days, but uh, I'm good. Unless you got more questions. No, this is good. This has okay. been good. Perfect. Well, um, yeah, no, I enjoyed this. You let um, me know when, uh, when you want to do that other story or whatever. Yeah. And uh, maybe, well, you know what? That'll give me time to read some of them. So maybe I can yeah. put a little bit of an outline together and remember some stories. Cause like I said, man, I'm <laughs> a rolling crime wave. You know what I mean? So yeah. I can, I can <laughs> up with shit all day long stories. It's just remembering them all, you know? So basically what you want, like funny stories of shit that you did. Yeah, interesting, I mean, funny, interesting. Uh, yeah. Anecdotal and in just interesting things yeah. kind of have a beginning, a middle of it and an end, you know, yeah, we, yeah. We scoped out the bank. We figured out how to do this. We watched this. We went in. We got this. This is what yep. we got. This is how it all kind of were things that went bad. You know, we <laughs> halfway through the job, two cop cars pulled up. We jumped in the car. Like, we outraced like them. these two fucking idiots that I take to do a bank machine. Oh, I got to be careful here. <laughs> Let's say my health wasn't so good at the time. Right. And I was... Um, confined to another vehicle while these two fucking idiots go and break into this bank machine and i specifically said when you go into this place i said go in the parking lot fucking turn around so you're facing out right these fucking idiots go in there in the truck fucking forward back out get stuck in the fucking snowbank and have to fucking run away and get caught because they fucking drove into the snowbank and get stuck in the fucking truck. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's uh, my buddy Zach has a story where he he had these people that were walking in and cashing checks, right, or pulling money. Sorry, they were pulling money out of their account. They would walk in, or I think they cashed checks, or I think they were cashing checks. Walked it, so he said he and his wife are sitting in a car. They drop the guy off. They wait in the parking lot. The guy walks in, cashes the check. Walks out. He's got like nine thousand dollars. Looks yep. over, sees Zach, and starts running. Uh -huh. Just runs with the money. Now, yeah. if he had just like over the course of the day, they were going to cash like whatever, like let's say ten checks for nine thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy was going to make like thirty or forty thousand yeah. dollars. So you're going to make forty grand. Instead, you get the first nine thousand dollars. You're gone. For running. Yeah. You just, just ruin you know, everything else. Right. He's like, this, he's like, I, I mean, they're drug addicts. He's like, you ever exactly. see they're drug addicts. He's like, you yeah. can't, you can't, you can't do that. Listen, I've so many guys, I meet people in jail and like, you know, I got a little bit of a reputation as someone that's good at making money and shit. Right. So I go to jail and I get a lot of guys, Oh, Chris, you know, I want to work with you. Blah, 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 blah. Well, you put fucking 20 grand or 30 grand into some idiot's hand. That's never had any type of money in their life. You want to watch someone self-destruct real quick? Yeah. <laughs> watch this motherfucker fall apart, right? Yeah, the fucking what, wheels just come off the bus real quick. Zach would put up these yeah. crews, and he said they were usually good for one, maybe two scams. He yeah. said, but after that, they fell apart They're every gone. time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every 100%. time. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. You can't – and that's another problem. Like, people are like – Oh, you know, why don't you just go find somebody here? And I'm like, you can't. You can't give these people money because they're going to self-destruct. They're going to be out at the bar or the crack house or whatever the fuck their vice is. 
bragging about everything that they just did. Yeah. Right. And their fucking amazing buddy Chris that showed them that fucking all of a sudden you got a problem on your hands. Right. <laughs> so it's you can't just grab anybody. Right. Yeah. You got to be very careful of who you select. And there's no one, uh, the pool's not very good right now. So here I am working, unfortunately. Well, but all right. When, whenever gonna... you're ready to come to Canada and Matt, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we're going to, we got, we're going to rack this up. All right. We gotta wrap this up. We'll do this um, on a private talk. <laughs> hey, so I appreciate you guys watching. Uh, if you like the video, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, um, hit the bell. So you get notified of videos like this. Also, if you really like the video, you can hit the, you can hit the thank you button and you can donate like a dollar 99 or $5 and 99 cents or something. It, the, the thank you button is actually on the scroll bar just below the video. You just scroll it over. It's the same bar that has the thumbs up and the share button. Scroll it over and you can hit thank you and and you know you can donate whatever a, a dollar ninety nine or four ninety nine or you know however much they got different increments. Um, also, leave me a comment in the comment section if you want to get a hold of me. My my email address is in the description. Uh, I also have a Patreon and uh, I sell paintings and I've got a whole bunch of true crime books also that are all on Amazon and all the links are in the description box. So I appreciate you guys. Um, appreciate you guys watching the video and thank you very much. See you.